There are dozens of videos on YouTube dealing with the subject of track cleaning. And most of them start with a disclaimer like This is just the way I do it. Or This is what works for me. So I thought it would be a good idea to add a little science to the mix. Welcome to the IOTT channel. I am Hans Tanner. In a nutshell, track cleaning has an aesthetical and a technical aspect. From an aesthetical point of view, we just want the track to look good. No dust or dirt on the track and no other debris in the vicinity of the roadbed. The tools to achieve such a clean look are pickup of trash, sweeping with a soft broom and occasional vacuum cleaning of the roadbed. Not a big problem, just annoying. The technical aspect of track cleaning is more interesting. The goal is to ensure high electrical conductivity between the rail and the wheel to keep the trains running. To achieve that, we try to remove everything from the rails that prevents current to flow. This can be an isolating coating on the rail like dirt or paint or oil and grease from locomotives. Or it can be an oxidation layer on the rail surface itself. There are two common methods to remove such insulation layers, mechanical and chemical removal. Mechanical removal is the way to go for any kind of coating. A razor blade to remove paint or a rag to wipe off grease and oil. And that's about where mechanical removal should stop. Even though it is promoted in a good number of videos, Using abrasives to remove oxidation from the rails is generally not a good idea. Even extremely fine sandpaper or the typical rubber blocks can leave scratches in the rail surface that in short time fill with dirt or oxidize and make the problem worse than before. If you want to learn more about these problems, I highly recommend the track cleaning video from Ron's Trains and Things linked in the description below. As far as I can see, this is one of the best videos on the subject and I fully agree with his findings that chemical treatment of the rails is the way to go. Now, when it comes to using chemicals on the rails, it makes a big difference what chemicals we use. There are substances that help and others that make the problem worse. In his video, Ron talks about polar and non-polar substances using the terminology from a 2019 article in Model Railroad Hobbyist authored by Joe Fugate. The article is a little more precise than Ron's video explaining that the suitability of a substance for rail cleaning depends on the dielectric constant of the substance and it gives a list of common substances along with their respective dielectric constants. Here is the explanation why this is the right way to evaluate chemicals. Track oxidization is mainly caused by micro-arcing or some very small and invisible sparks that discharge between the rail and the wheel. How can that be? Well, every time the wheel is not in firm contact with the rail surface, it is electrically isolated and the current does not start to flow right away. In this situation, the wheel together with the rail starts to act as capacitor. There is an electrical charge developing between the rail and the wheel. Once a certain voltage over the gap is reached, this capacitor discharges with a small arc and the current starts to flow. And now you can already see why micro-arcing is even a more serious problem when using DCC compared to regular DC. In DCC, the polarity of the voltage between wheel and rail changes about 22,000 times per second, and every single polarity change briefly stops the current flow and therefore creates a new opportunity for a capacitor to form and discharge in a micro-arc. Applying typical chemicals to clean the track has now a tendency to make the problem even worse. 
Most solvents are not good electrical conductors. In fact, they usually are insulators or so-called dielectrics. Which means they are helpful in forming that capacitor between wheel and rail. And this is where the dielectric constant, which is a characteristic of each substance, becomes important. A high dielectric constant means that the capacitor that is formed has a high capacity and therefore can store a large charge at the given voltage in comparison to a capacitor using a dielectric with a small dielectric constant. And of course, a large charge also means a large micro arc once the capacitor discharges. So to reduce the problem, you want to use a solvent with a low dielectric constant and to eliminate the problem altogether, you want to use a chemical that actually is conductive instead of insulating. The list in the quoted article groups the substances by their dielectric constant. If the value is below 3, the chemical is considered suitable for the purpose of track cleaning. These are mainly mineral spirits like kerosene or petroleum. On the other end of the spectrum, we find liquids like water or isopropyl alcohol, which are frequently used for track cleaning, but rather add to the problem than help to solve it. The only substance on that end of the list that I would consider helpful when cleaning track is the one with a dielectric constant of 25, but it is rather for the cleaner than for the track. To eliminate the problem altogether, Ron then suggests using a substance called No Ox ID A Special from Sanchem. As it turns out, this is not a solvent, but rather some sort of a contact grease. I first looked up the material safety data sheet, which lists mineral spirits as main ingredient. That's already in the right category. What I liked in addition is that the substance seems to be inflammable, non-toxic and skin-friendly, which are all characteristics I like to see in a chemical that is used in areas where kids may be around. Furthermore, it has a shelf life of more than 10 years, which indicates that it is chemically very stable. So I ordered a 2-ounce pot from Amazon to give it a try. That was about three months ago. Once I got it, I applied a very tiny amount to my N-scale test track, which always has given me a lot of conductivity problems, especially after sitting unused for a month or two. I let the train run back and forth a few times and the difference was noticeable. Or flabbergasting, to be more precise. It was like night and day. No more disruptions at all. The locomotives could go from one end of the track to the other without the slightest flickering of the headlights. And best of all, after that I let it sit for a month and when I returned, it was still the same. Unbelievable. So from an electrical point of view, this substance is very convincing. What I was not sure about is the impact on the pulling force of the locomotives. After all, no oxide is sort of a grease that gets applied to the track, and grease normally does not go along well with maximum friction. So I decided to investigate that point and bought some spring balances to measure pulling forces before and after the application of the substance. Next, I selected six locomotives representing several manufacturers with different weight and various axle configurations. Here are some pictures of the locomotives and their relevant technical data. I then placed one after the other on a straight and even track section free of track joints and measured the force I can apply on the hook 
before the locomotive started to glide on the track. Maybe this is a good point to remember some principles from middle school physics classes. There are two types of friction, static and kinetic, sometimes also called sliding friction. As a general rule, static friction is always higher than kinetic friction. You experience that, for example, when you want to move a piece of furniture around. To get it sliding requires significantly more force than keep it moving once it started to slide. The same goes for locomotives. Once the wheels start gliding, the pulling force is lower than when the wheels are firmly locked with the rail. That might be against our gut's feeling, but it is what our physics professors tried to teach us. So, to measure the maximum pulling force, it is the easiest way to just apply force on a standing locomotive until it starts to slide. That way we can simply observe the scale indicator and the end of the spring and get a reading as soon as the spring starts to pull the locomotive. That's much easier than actually driving the locomotive actively and try to read the scale while detecting the first signs of spinning of the wheels. Here is a table with all locomotives and the results of the pulling force measurement before applying NOVOX ID to the track. I never thought about the pulling force of a typical model locomotive and I must say I was actually surprised how little it is. No wonder these locomotives start to slip quite easily when pulling a train uphill. Next I applied a tiny amount of no oxide around the test track and let the locomotives run for a few laps. Like on the N scale test track, the difference was immediate and noticeable. I must say though that this test track is very uneven and the treatment did not solve all problems for all locomotives. But I guess if all driving axles are lifted off the track because it is that uneven, there is no substance in the world that could help here. After letting them run for a little while, I placed the locomotives back on the same track section and in the same direction as when I took the first measurement and again hooked them up to the spring balance. And what I measured seemed to immediately confirm my most serious concerns. A reduction of pulling force of up to about 50% is what I got out of these measurements. Interesting to see that the reduction was less severe on the locomotives with no or only very few traction tires. It seems that the friction coefficient of rubber on metal is more reduced by degrees than the one of metal on metal. At this point I had serious doubts about using no oxide on a real layout with real uphill sections. But then, as I never have spent any thoughts on pulling force, I was also not sure what force actually is needed to pull a real train. So I placed a string of freight cars on the track and hooked up the spring scale. And again I was surprised to see how little force is needed to make the train move at least on a flat track. About 0.1 Newton or 100 grams was enough to pull the entire train. So even with the reduced force after greasing the tracks, the train should not be a challenge to pull. And indeed I hooked up a locomotive and it had no problems to pull the train. Of course my bad road bed made some cars derail every so often, but that is a different problem. Nevertheless, I was still concerned because of the amount of the reduction of the pulling force. So I tried to wipe the track with a clean rag but no other substance like a solvent and repeated the test. There was no difference. It seems once applied to the rail surface, the substance pretty much sticks to it which is in line with the experience made on the end track where even after a month the effect was unchanged. And from other modelers I hear that one single application lasts for months if not years. 
Looking up the instructions, the recommendation is to let the layout sit for 24 hours after application. So that is what I did before I repeated the pulling force test. As you see, the pulling force has improved over time, but never recovered to the value I saw before applying the substance. So to conclude, I would absolutely consider NOx ID to improve electrical conductivity between wheel and track. The effect on conductivity is almost unbelievable and long-lasting. So if you are looking for a track cleaning method that allows you to do it once and be done for a long time, here it is. I still have some doubts though regarding the impact on pulling force. There is clearly a significant reduction that does not go away after a few days. Now, if your layout is mostly flat, this is probably not causing any problems, as the pulling force of a typical locomotive is still significantly higher than the force needed to pull a typical train. However, if your layout includes significant grades, you probably want to measure the force that is required to pull your typical trains over the hill before you apply NOx ID to your tracks, because getting rid of it once it is applied, it does not seem like an easy task. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you, and you learned a few new things about how to make sure your trains keep running. If so, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to not miss any future videos like this, and click the like button below. Doing so keeps me motivated and helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general, as it causes the YouTube algorithm to suggest IOTT videos to a broader audience. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.